Hi, I'm Stuart Molina, and this is the latest installment of Conversations with the Maestro, where I have intimate conversations with members of our orchestra, members of the HSO family, a chance for you to get to know the people who make the HSO tick. Today, uh, we're having a conversation with Dwayne and Karen Botterbush. They've been playing in the orchestra for many years. Uh, Dwayne is a a bass player in our section, and Karen, in addition to being a flutist, is our principal piccolo player. So you'll learn a little bit about some instruments that maybe you don't know too much about today. But before we go to Duane and Karen, I wanted to mention to you that starting on April 22nd and running all the way to May 22nd, uh, we will be airing our latest uh, youth orchestra concert, so I encourage you all to go to that. It is free for watching. Uh, just go to our website, harrisburgsymphony.org, uh, and you can get information about how to get a link. Uh, but right now, let's go to uh, Karen and Dwayne. Well, hello, Dwayne and Karen. It's wonderful to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Stuart. Hello, Good to be Stuart. here with you. How's everything going in uh, Gettysburg? Good. Good. We've stayed healthy. You can't ask for better than that these days. That's right. wonderful to yeah. hear. Fully, fully vaccinated and uh, ready to go. Well, that's great news. Hopefully soon we will be back on stage right. together. Yeah. Although, Dwayne, you've played, you've played with us this year. How has that been, uh, performing with the HSO in different circumstances? Uh, uh, well, I was really grateful to get to, to be with my colleagues. Uh, that was a, a lot of fun. Um, so so that was a, that, that's a good thing. It has been demanding. To, it's been demanding times, and and uh, um, th that was only my second performance uh, since last March. Wow, that's and, amazing! And so, no, I've done. We've done some other things, but but it, it's been a long time. So it was was great fun. And what what better music than than all that those pop strings arrangements? <laughs> um, and and. Uh, it was really fun. I really enjoyed the tangos. I really liked it. And I recommend if they haven't listened to it, they, 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 they need to tune into that concert. I have to agree with you there. I thoroughly enjoyed that whole experience and the orchestra sounded great. So I, what we normally do is start out talking about uh, biographical stuff. I will start out by saying that the two of you are, uh, are married and both members of the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra. I believe there's only one, oh, there are two other pairs of, uh, of, of spouses in our orchestra, um, but none has been in the orchestra longer than the two of you. And uh, so I think that you'll add a little bit of historical perspective about what the orchestra has gone through in the last few decades. Um, but let's start out by wh where did you grow up? Where did you come from? And how did you come to music? I, I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan lived there through first grade. And then we moved three times during elementary school, did a year and a half in East Rochester, a year and a half in Glendora, California, outside of Los Angeles, and then two years in Plainfield, New Jersey. Wow, those are major shifts. Yeah, we, my dad changed companies. Uh -huh. uh, and then by seventh grade, we went back to Ann Arbor. <laughs> He ended up in the same company again that he started in, but at a higher level. <laughs> um, so I started flute playing. In, well, I started piano in third grade mm -hmm. um, and started flute in fifth grade in, in different states um, and started private study in the summer after seventh grade when I was in Ann Arbor. I started with a student teacher who sent me to my first good teacher, who was the wife of the horn professor at Michigan. And that horn professor taught two of the horn players in the Harrisburg Symphony. Oh, isn't that a funny connection? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in 11th grade, I started studying with the University of Michigan professor across mm -hmm. town. Um, so when did you get the sense that this was something that was going to be more than just uh, a fun thing to do in school? By ninth grade, I knew this was the career I really wanted. Wow. Uh, we, we had a civics class that we had to choose careers and interview and shadow people. And so I went and listened to somebody else's flute lesson with my teacher. <laughs> and uh, she said, you know, if you really want to do this, you should start teaching. So in 10th grade, I started a couple of young sixth grade students and taught from 
from then on. <laughs> oh, that's really and, wonderful. And she said it was good for me to start young because that way, if I had questions, I could come to her and say, what do you do when the student does this? You know, so it was very helpful that she encouraged me to do that. Um, wow. I had, well, that's... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. I was going to say I had many really nice opportunities to play in high school. Uh, I played three years with the Michigan Youth Symphony. I played with a, a group called Musical Youth International my junior year that went to Japan in the summer. Um, I was able to solo with my high school band and orchestra, well, chamber orchestra. Uh, I soloed with the Michigan Youth Symphony. And then the Ann Arbor Symphony had a youth concerto competition that I won. So I really got to, in thinking about coming to do this interview, I, I thought, boy, I really had some wonderful opportunities. Well, uh, Ann Arbor is such a, an incredible place for music. I mean, there's right. so much going on professionally yeah. and at the school, Absolutely. Um, kind of surrounded with music everywhere you turn. Yeah. So Dwayne, did, uh, did you also grow up in the Midwest? What was, what, where did you uh, start out? No, I'm, I'm a Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania boy <laughs> through and through. And a, and a total Pennsylvania pro, um, product, I, I, I would label myself. Um, I grew up in York, Pennsylvania, was my home. Mm -hmm. And um, so from, from York, I, I um, decided that I would go to music, um, purposely chose a music ed degree, um, where I, which led me to uh, Mansfield State College uh, for my first degree and, and um Second degree was was uh, a master's, and um, I, and I ended up at at, at Westchester uh, for for my master's degree. But along the way, um, my my education led me to. I had some really launching pad experiences. There was an old um, program by the American Federations of, of, of Musicians called the Congress of Strings. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I haven't heard of it, no. It, what it, is well, it? it it's, it's an older program. And, and it was, its purpose was literally to restock American orchestras with North American, Canadian, and, um, and US musicians after World War II. And, wow. and, and um, it lasted for quite a while. And uh, I, that's where I was a student of Barry Green in mm -hmm. uh, the University of Cincinnati um, and two hour lessons to, to, you know. Well, he's, he's a legend in terms of music yeah, pedagogy oh, and performance. We, we were coming through at the time that he was experimenting with his inner game of music things. And we were often, um, often his guinea pigs in, in the lessons. <laughs> and, and that was, it was wonderful fun. I spied myself doing it to my students. Uh, so that was a launching pad. Uh, and while at Mansfield, I was uh, auditioned for and was accepted in the Corning Philharmonic in Corning, New York, uh, the Elmira Symphony later on, uh, only one year experience there. Um, so needless to say, I, I was hooked <laughs> and, and, and really, uh, really enjoyed it. And, and uh, you know, so with the logical progression, it, it's, uh, you, you come out and you, you want to teach. I, I wanted to teach and, and um, cause I've literally taught from kindergarten through graduate school and, and uh, but I knew I wanted to play and, and that led to Harrisburg Symphony and, and all my current uh, playing throughout the region. And, and uh, so that, that's kind of, kind of my story. My, my parents were very supportive to to get me lessons right off the bat. And, and um, um, I, re I remember many years later, my mother said, well, if we, we, we could have done better, it was like, mom, stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am the musician I am because of the world experiences and, and yeah. things. Um, like a lot of my students are shocked to find out, I was a wrestler in high school and two years in college, you know, and, and I, you know, I was lucky to go to a place that allowed me to do that. Sure. I eventually had to admit music school was going to consume me. And, and I went and went that, that direction. So well, I'm glad that's... you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you have, you have to eventually say that this path is only going to work this way. So, 
Sure. So that's that's kind of my story, a Pennsylvania story, very much so. And that's very cool. And and Karen, so we left you uh, before college. Where did you end up going to college? And then how did you end up in Harrisburg yourself or in, in central Pennsylvania? Um, I went to the University of Michigan. And during during the time that I was at the university, I supplemented my playing with three years of Ann Arbor Symphony, uh, which was really nice after having been their soloist to, to go into sure. a piccolo player. Um, well, let's talk for a moment about that. When did you... Um, I mean, I, I can't say make the shift to piccolo because you still have a full uh, performance life as a flutist as well. But was piccolo something that just came along with flute or uh, did you um, decide to play piccolo? In ninth grade, I, my parents bought me a, a piccolo and th- with my teacher's suggestion, got me a very nice piccolo. Um, and I fell in love with it right away. My Michigan professor that I had started with in high school and studied with for part of the time. I had three different professors at Michigan, um, partly because the first one became a dean and only had grad students. Uh, The second one was on sabbatical the next year. So the Detroit Symphony piccolo player, Clement Barone came and I studied with him. Uh, So I had three different different teachers while I was there, but um, my first professor said, you know, good flute players are a dime a dozen. Good piccolo players are hard to find. If you like playing piccolo, you ought to focus on that. And I, I really like it. That's really cool. That's, it's interesting. So it was both a question of your, uh, your love of the instrument and a pragmatism that, that comes along with it. Right. Right. (laughs) And, and my father really liked piccolo. He's, my parents were horn players. That's mm-hmm. how they met in, in college in the horn section. Um, but I know he would often talk about a piccolo player that played in the band with him when he was young. Um, so maybe he also helped encourage me. But, yeah. and, and by getting a good instrument, bad piccolos are horrible. So <laughs> get a good instrument to start with that, that also. Well, helped. good piccolos with bad players are horrible too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So when you graduated from Michigan, uh, what what then happened to, to, well, to bring you I, here? I married a man from Hershey, uh, and he had one more year of school because he did a five year program. Mm-hmm. So that extra year, I continued in the Ann Arbor Symphony, and then we moved to Harrisburg in the summer of 1975. Mm-hmm. And I was very lucky that at that time there was a piccolo opening in Harrisburg Symphony. And I decided that if I got in the symphony, I could get another job just to help and and not worry about my teaching that I would be satisfying my music with with the playing. Um, So I worked in a tailor shop sewing, which is another love of mine. Wow. Uh And and back in ninth grade, when we had to choose careers, that was my second choice was to be a, a tailor or seamstress. And that's the only other thing I've done professionally uh, besides teaching and playing. And um, after about nine months of working in the tailor shop and playing in the symphony, people in the symphony started saying, you sure you won't teach my students? I could really use a teacher. So I quit the job tailoring and, and uh, started teaching again, which is really a, a love of mine. I, I really like teaching privately. Yeah, well, both of you have had uh, yeah. storied careers as, uh, as teachers in this region. Um, so the magic moment has come, I assume. So how did you meet each other? And, uh, and, and, and tell us that story. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that question. Um, <laughs> we, we both found ourselves there, there in the symphony in this was, we're talking 19, in the 70s, uh-huh. okay? And, and we both found, found uh, us to be single parents, uh, both uh, with, with a family in, in, charge of a, in charge of a family. And, and um, one night uh, after a rehearsal, I daringly, uh, daringly said, um, how about a cup of coffee? Oh, you bald rogue. <laughs> <laughs> and... and uh, the, the response, the response, though, Stuart was, well, maybe not a cup of coffee. I, I don't drink coffee. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. You know, 
said the wrong thing right out of the gate. But anyway, uh, uh, things things progressed in, in, in to that, and we had so much in common. Um, and you know, a bunch of music geeks. Our first date was uh, tickets to the Canadian Brass, and and, uh, and that sort of that sort of thing. And and um, um, but like it, we we it turned into if you remember the Brady Bunch. I've seen it a few the, the, hundred the, times. A few <laughs> okay, the the TV show we very much became a a Brady Bunch. Um, experience in when the the kids started complaining um you know wh why don't i get to see them more <laughs> i guess it it was time it was time and and um we dated and, long enough that the kids wanted to be together too that's awesome that's the way it should work i'm uh, uh, Dwayne's yeah. son and my older daughter are 18 days apart Step wow. twins. Wow. Yep. So we raised step twins. And That's our younger amazing. daughter is only two years younger. My my other daughter. So we the blended girls and boys. That's why yep. the Brady Bunch. Um, and so they they are still to this day very close. I and, prefer to say partners in crime. You yes. Know? <laughs> <laughs> and they live on in different states and it doesn't matter. They they know things about each other before we know things about them which is really cool. They're still communicating a lot. So that, that's how that, that came about. And, um, and, and there's some great, there were some great moments in the symphony. Um, like when, with this interview, it made us remember that while we were dating, um, we, were, we were doing uh, a Mahler symphony. Mm -hmm. And guess it just happened to be Mahler one. Um, when a guy that had more hair at the time was playing the solo in, in, in the, in the slow, in the slow movement. And, and to this day, um, that's a very special symphony for both of us because, um, we were dating at the time and, and, and I got to play the solo and, and, uh, the kids and, would go to the piano and play. Da, 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 da. I'm sure they had it <laughs> they coming out of their lot. ears. That's and really then, funny. And when we got a puppy. Uh, we named our puppy Gustav Mahler. We called him Gus. <laughs> his, his nickname was Gus, but yeah. that's really yeah. sweet. Bearded, bearded Collie, wonderful, wonderful animal. He's a great, great dog. So. Well, before we talk more about your experiences in Harrisburg, let's take a moment and uh, see one of the uh, the musical offerings that you have. What what are we going to be seeing? Okay, um, three years ago, I was very lucky and got a new flute. And it's beautiful. And I thought maybe the audience doesn't get to hear me play flute. Maybe it would be fun to play a flute solo. And you gracefully, great, <laughs> you graciously said that you would accompany me. Um, so this is a piece by Herman Beeftink uh, that I was introduced to by one of my adult students. Uh, he likes to bring me new music just to try. And it's a piece called Seasons. And this movement is spring, which I thought was appropriate for an April interview. Um, Herman Beeftink uh, was born in the Netherlands and studied and taught there. Uh, he was born in 1953. Uh, in 1982, he left the Netherlands and moved to Los Angeles where he started studio music with film and TV and eventually did composing for TV and film. Um, but this was a piece written for flute and piano, so. Well, very cool, let's, uh, let's watch the piece.
Well, I have to say it was a great pleasure to perform with you. It's always uh, fun for me to play with the players in the orchestra and take on different roles and uh, perhaps a little bit more collegial than the fairly collegial uh, feeling we have in the orchestra. Uh, and it was really nice to hear this piece. I thought it was extremely tuneful, extremely folky, um, kind of a, a theme and variations uh, in, in a very comfortable harmonic world. Um, so thank you very much for that. Yes, certainly. I, so, I thought it had a, a Celtic flavor to it. Yeah, it, it definitely feels that way, which, which I guess makes sense. He's Northern European and uh, right. at, at any rate, Many, many thanks. Um, and it's great to hear you play flute as always. Although I have had the opportunity of conducting orchestras with you playing flute mm -hmm. as, well as, uh, as well as piccolo. So where we left you was in the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra. And, uh, and I thought that maybe this would be an opportunity to talk about uh, the changes you've seen in the orchestra over the, the, what, 45? How long have you been playing with the orchestra? 45 years? 46 and 47. That is, that is fantastic. And so you've that seen- means, That ahead. means that between the two of us, we've played as long as the symphony's been around. <laughs> there you go. You know, I hadn't sure thought of that. That's the best analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you have actually seen a, a, a major seismic change yes. Yes. Uh, in the orchestra. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and w what it was like to play in the orchestra? What kind of an orchestra it was in the 70s as opposed to uh, the, the same things now? How is it playing in this, in this different kind of orchestra? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that, that one. Um, it, I would describe it as the Harrisburg Symphony was uh, more, more community-based at the time. Mm -hmm. um, there were, mind you, it was a good one. It was a good one. And when yep. new conductors were needed, it was a sought after orchestra. And, and so that reputation was, um, was building even, even back then. Uh -huh. um, so you graduate then to a decision is made to um, Harrisburg deserves an even more professional uh, level, mm -hmm. even a more professional level in, in, um, in its orchestra offering um, in, in the area. Uh, so that comes um, at a time when there was a, a conductor change. Uh, Larry Newland was, came, came in at, at that particular time following David Epstein. Uh, David Epstein wasn't, was what, what, perhaps four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then uh, the search went uh, for, for Newland who really advanced the professionalism uh, of, of the orchestra. He was obviously affiliated with the New York Philharmonic. So he certainly had um, a model uh, the, the, to, to, to build upon and, and to grow with. Um, the, but the level just continued to grow. And I might say the literature mm -hmm. able to be played yep. has also grown. Um, and to the point where we're a full-blown regional professional symphony orchestra uh, at which I bet, Stuart, you could program what you want. There and really it, are no limits to what and, I can and, program. And, and, and that to me was just the level of that professionalism um, uh, was, uh, was very attractive. Uh, this doesn't happen with just us on the stage either. Uh, it happens with, with um, an extremely dedicated board that really knows their role and what they are producing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and I'll put a, put a, a say, saying out to them that, that we appreciate, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we really appreciate that. So that, that's, that's a, a, a good thing too. The whole staff, um, it, it's, it's not a one man show. Uh, it's not a one or two women show, you know, it, <laughs> it's, it's not there. You, you, you've, um, it's an investment in the community and it's being done right. It, it's a model, honestly, it's a, it's a model organization. When I speak to people um, and they don't seem to understand the levels of orchestras in, in the United States, 
um, I often say, hey, are you a baseball fan? And, and they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually follow, follow baseball. I said, okay, well, you know, there's, there's the, the major leagues and then there's the, the next one, the next level down. Um, and so consider that regional symphony orchestra, like AAA baseball, that, that uh, the players are functioning uh, at the highest level. And, and, um, and so that, that usually sticks, but it's been a long, it's been a long journey. Uh, Karen's and my timing in it, we were lucky enough to grow. I knew I always wanted to play. I loved my teaching, don't get me wrong, but, but, but I always wanted to play and, um, and I always wanted to be, I always wanted to be in Harrisburg. I might've grown up in York, but, but Harrisburg was, uh, was honestly where I wanted, wanted to be. Yeah. So, so it's been a, a long, exciting, any, any additions? Well, Karen? I'm, I'm just glad in all of that, that I've been able to progress with the orchestra yeah, right. and keep the level, which is part of the reason why new instruments now and then, or new head joint to the flutes or the piccolo, just to make sure that the quality of playing stays at the level that the orchestra had become, you know. Well, sure. And, uh, and talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the shift from a, 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 a local orchestra where most of the players are living, you know, very, very close to what we have now, which is people coming in from f some extremely great distances, but certainly for, you know, a few hours drive in, in most cases. Has that changed the vibe in the orchestra at all? Um, well, I think that vibe starts um, right from the top, from, mm -hmm. from the guy standing swinging the baton yeah. uh, to... Yeah. Uh, to, to the staff and all the way down. But as you get those, uh, let's call them out of town freelancers, uh, you're getting extremely high quality uh, musicians. And, um, and so, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. If your, your goal is we're, we're gonna produce a better product on, on the stage. Um, it, it, it's not to say that there aren't good musicians in Harrisburg because there are oh, no, no, no. musicians right there and, that are in the orchestra. Absolutely. And I know, I know you hear it. You heard a lot about the word family. It, it really is that it, yeah, it's networking and professional things like that. I mean, I learned something all the time from my buddies in the base, base section. Somebody's always trying something new a new bow and it's passed around the section mm -hmm. a new rosin and, and 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 so it's uh both professionally and and your comfort level with the you're playing with friends it, yeah. it's people mm -hmm. that are that are supportive and and you like being there um we do stay overnight on one night when we have the early morning uh mm -hmm. dress rehearsal and and so that gives us a touch of the flavor of what's going on with those that stay for the whole run of, of a, any given set. Um, and, and it's, it's really, it's quite, quite nice. And, and, um, everybody looks after one another and, and, um, it, yeah, it is the words family. Well, it's yeah. great to hear. So let's shift gears for just a moment and talk about your roles in the orchestra, because I mean, in the two of you, it's almost, it's almost comical that we have the very highest, instrument in the orchestra, the piccolo, and the very lowest instrument in the orchestra, the double bass. Um, first, I, I mean, I, I have two questions. I, one is about, you know, what it is to be playing on those far ends of the sound spectrum uh, and, and how you feel in terms of your roles in the orchestra. And the other is kind of contrasting the two because uh, Dwayne, you play in our bass section. It is a section of, you know, anywhere from three to eight double bass players playing the same part essentially uh, with a few exceptions. And Karen, who is quite literally playing a solo part every moment that you're playing piccolo. Yeah. Is, is there a, 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 a mental difference in terms of the way you, you, you guys prepare for these uh, performances? And uh, so let, let's first talk about you know, the, 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 the ends of the spectrum the very highest, the very lowest. What is that like being in an orchestra and, and being at those far ends? Fortunately, I'm a bit of a diva and I don't mind being heard. <laughs> As a piccolo player, you have no choice. <laughs> right. Um, 
I, I like being the sparkle, mm -hmm. the extra sound that other people can't produce. Um, it's a fussier instrument. It's harder to stay in tune and harder to play dynamic differences. Mm -hmm. um, but like I had said before, I really enjoy it. Um, I, and I like being a soloist. Are, are there moments where it's scary? I mean, what, what, what jumps oh, to my oh, mind oh, is like oh, the, yeah. the, the, end, the end of Tchaikovsky. Romeo and Juliet. Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony is oh. the scariest. Um, yeah, because yeah. you literally sit for 40 minutes before you start on a high solo. Oh, that's and right. it's a technical solo. And the first time I played that, I was ill from nerves. <laughs> but the second time I figured out how to practice and prepare for it. Um, <laughs> you, you get the instrument out of the case, put it up to your mouth and play that solo. Yeah. You can't you can't warm up because forty minutes of sitting you've lost all you've warmed up. <laughs> you know, but yes. but you make sure your husband is on the other side <laughs> of of the house. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, and and you do it for two months before you have to play. Every time the instrument comes out of the case, that's what you play. Yeah, that's solo. Wow. It's, yeah, so that that's the that's peak scary. of nervousness. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet. You well, but, to but say Romeo. I also think about like Prokofiev, Romeo, and Juliet at yes. the very end, where you just have a high C yeah. that sits there yeah. forever. Yes, and well, I always, know, I mean, I'm not a piccolo player, but I imagine keeping pitch in a, a very soft high note would be difficult. Yeah, yeah, but that it's interesting that you picked that piece because that is my very favorite piece to listen to. I I just love. It is spectacular and music. And, and it's challenging, but fun to play too. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And so Dwayne, how about you? I mean, you are, you're playing on the opposite end. Right. Sometimes uh, it's really only audible sometimes in, in the, the partials that are being played above you. And yet without the basses, an orchestra doesn't sound like an orchestra. I mean, in any possible way what is that like when you're sitting at the bottom of the uh of the staff literally and figuratively well you sure better be in tune okay you you sure better be in tune because um you know i teach my students uh when when i was um an orchestra director listen down listen down find the fundamental you know, find and 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 listen down, and so so you sure better be in tune with with all of that. Uh, I'll echo what 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 Karen just said that that the the really tiny creates difficulty, the really big creates difficulty. That's a similar item within you know the extremes of 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 the two instruments. Um, Playing in a sec now, you have soloists, and, and we, we often argue the point of which is more difficult, okay, to have the pressure of the diva solo, okay, or, or um, like an organ, a section, you push a key and many pipes go. And, and so which is the more, the more intense to do absolutely everything as a team or the pressure of an individual, uh, you know, operating. I'll, I'll bring you back to my wrestling analogy. I said I was a wrestler in my athletic experiences. Um, it, it's like being on a wrestling team. You have your individual job to do, but yet it's for the good of the team. Yep. Yeah. It, it's for the for the good of the team, and then the greater good of the in, the entire. Or orchestra, but we do sometimes have fun coming down the highway back to Gettysburg <laughs> saying, and she said, wow, that, that one just went, that went pretty well for, for my, I came in on blah, 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 and, and, and this and that. And I said, yeah, but, but, but honey, I, the, you know, the bass section was right on the money <laughs> on, on the whole, the whole group effort. And, and which is just an, uh, another sort of discipline that's necessary uh, for a quality product. And, and so I, I would call those analogies. Uh, to for you there. Yeah, so let, let's circle back to something you said earlier about practicing on either end of the house. <laughs> Are you actually even able to practice at the same time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like college when there was a practice room next to a practice room and you learned to block yeah. out something else. But we teach at the same time in opposite rooms of the 
on wow. that too. Um, and it it's fine. Um, well, I think this is a perfect time to go to our second uh, our second musical offering because it features you playing bass and piccolo together. Tell us what we're going to hear and what it was like uh, putting it together. Well, it, we were determined we were going to find a piccolo and double <laughs> bass uh, duet. Um, I've tried. I went on that journey before, and and I was determined this time it was really going to happen. Well, and I found some pieces, and and I I perhaps label them a little bit off the wall, and and uh, um, and, and certainly not something you're going to pull out of your hat in in a few days. Um, the the other thing then the idea came the idea came uh, perhaps we should do something that has her doing the melody line and with me doing backing her up well that's baroque sonata and and so we decided that we'd look for a baroque sonata that was uh, a good example uh, for piccolo and it's a lively one. Uh, I think in this pandemic, we could all use some, some, some lively music, but it would also be, a, it'll also be a good example of uh, the double bass player uh, playing through and doing the figured bass, so to speak, um, of, of the piece. And it's an active, it's, it's an active part. And, and so, and so that was our solution to, to and we're going to play a piece, a sonata in F major by Telemann. A Baroque, Fantastic. Com Baroque composer. And so that fit the bill for us. And, and it's, it's one that I, that I think will demonstrate the contrast of the, the highest and the lowest. So, well, I can't wait to hear it. Let's, uh, let's hear this Telemann Sonata. Again, that was very, very beautiful. And Telemann always amazes me just in the fact that Telemann was the most prolific composer of all time. Mm. Uh, in fact, copyists, professional copyists have said that they couldn't copy in their professional lifetimes the music that Telemann composed. 
in his lifetime. Uh, it, very beautiful music. And actually, you know, I, I, I love the combination. I think it really works very, very well the way that you presented it. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about teaching because I know it's been a big part of both of your lives. Um, I certainly can say uh, in Dwayne's case, he built a, a very spectacular school program in the Gettysburg area, one that's actually storied. Uh, and I assume that you take great pride in that. Um, yeah. And Karen, you have taught many uh, flute, young flutists uh, mm -hmm. in your career. Um, and I wanna talk about how teaching relates to performance. So how does, how does teaching inform performance? And then how does performance inform teaching? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I have found that while I'm teaching, I'm trying to just figure out what it is that I'm doing when I'm playing. And when I'm practicing, I'm constantly thinking of things that I can use in my teaching. Um, and I also think it's very helpful for my students to know that I have to practice as much as they do, that I'm constantly learning. You, musician never stops learning. There's always new music to play and, and new ideas thrown at you by other performers. And uh, I've learned so much from other flutists, whether they are regular section members or people who come in and sub with us. Um, and those little ideas come into my, my teaching as well. Um, I really like being able to share the love of music with a student. Not to say you've got to go be a, a musician, but to let them know what a wonderful part of life music can be. Yeah, that's wonderful. And Dwayne? Well, um, I, I, would, I would go on your, your, your question of the relativity of the, the, um, the performing to um, the, the, the teaching. And I'd throw out this particular thought. How can you produce a good sound unless you've heard one, okay? So it, you always need to be thinking of, of that. And when I was a public school uh, orchestra director with, with a full-blown symphony orchestra um, for, for me to, to enjoy, um, we had to we had to get out of town and, and go listening, whether it was to the Harrisburg Symphony, to the Baltimore Symphony, to, you know, and, and so, you had to cultivate their ears, you know, because how are you going to produce a good sound unless you have heard uh, a good sound? I also find a lot of, of teaching is um, a lot of common sense modeling. When, when I would have students, whether they were student teachers from my time at, at Gettysburg College, when, where I was an adjunct professor, um, uh, they, they, would, they would say to me, say to me, this, the, the first time they would teach a lesson, that was really hard, <laughs> okay? Well, yeah, it was because every single word you say, every si single thing you model for them is, is, is going to be absorbed by that student. So you have to be on call yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. It, during during that that uh, that lesson, or if it's an orchestra rehearsal at school, um, in in a school school program, um, the the other thing I I I always taught in in uh, my string methods class, uh, Gettysburg College had a, a, a high quality music ed degree, and and you had to come through my course of string methods class uh, to set you know for your certificate, and and um, so with, with, with that, they, you've, you've got to um, not give up on, on the little people. Let, I was an elementary string teacher, beginner. It was the purest amount of teaching that, that I did as, as perhaps a high school uh, and a collegiate orchestra director at Gettysburg College for a while. You're a bit of an administrator too, mm -hmm. and, and you got to administrate. But I would preach at string methods class, little people don't know what's hard. Don't tell them. 
<laughs> so you begin with a post Picado and Sautiers, Sautier, yeah, yeah. But 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 don't tell them. Um, yeah, the, the word hard is almost a prejudicial word that someone formed it, that that Im impression, and 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 just release them from that. Um, I used to say. It, if you like your teapot and you like your tea, don't tell the kids, just keep pouring in the water, just keep making tea, you know? And you know, it's, it's, it's a good point. And it's, it's something that I talk about as well when people ask me about getting young people interested in classical music. It's like, well, if yeah. you don't tell them it's classical music right. Right. and don't tell them it's serious music, they're gonna like it because it's really great. And in a lot of cases, yeah. a lot of fun. And I guess for technique, it's the same kind of thing. If you don't uh, make them feel like they're doing something really difficult, then they'll just do it. I, it <laughs> yeah, that brings me to a thought in, in the, the Gettysburg School District program the, where I was middle school, high school, in other words, secondary uh, uh, school teacher, um, we had a very successful Pops concert and we had to go to two performances and, and we, we had tables and, the, and waiter, the, the, wow. the kids were the waiters and we switched orchestras and it, it, it really was, was a lot of fun. But I remember year after year, the students saying to me, hey, Bottomish, when are we gonna be done with this Pops concert stuff? You showed me that that symphony we're going to do in the spring concert. When are we getting to that? Isn't you that know? funny? And and it was was a matter. It's not that they're you know. And and the kids would say, "Hey, Mr. Barbers, do you do you like rock music?" And and my my stock answer was, "Yeah, good rock music." <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, good rock music. Good is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And so and I think. Um, whether it's the Harrisburg Symphony or an elementary orchestra, uh, um, uh, a high school orchestra, um, people are attracted to good art and, and yeah. things that, that become part of them and they can relate with. So Absolutely true. So, so one last thing that I'd like to ask you about, actually probably second to last thing. When you're not doing music, I mean, music has, is all, all encompassing in your lives, but clearly there are things that you do that are outside of music. What are the things that you are passionate about other than music? Do you want to answer? Well, we have a real love of travel and have been very lucky. Uh, when our children were young teenagers, we, well, from, from the beginning, we always planned vacations with the children in mind. Mm -hmm. But when they were young teenagers, we took them to Hawaii and there were mess ups with the airlines and we got extra flight points and, and, <laughs> and we ended up taking them to Europe the next year and started their love of seeing more of the world. Um, but particularly since 2000 and on, we've had the opportunity to travel to 67 countries together. Oh my and, gracious. And all seven continents. Well, I know you, you, you and I have traveled together to China. Yeah, that was an yeah. amazing trip. Yeah, it certainly and was. And so what was the most, the most spectacular of all of the trips that you've taken? Oh, wow. Well, I have a favorite place, and that's Zermatt, Switzerland. I just love the, the Alps. And Duane had been an exchange student in high school in Switzerland, and so that's kind of been a destination. We've gone back and visited with his host family and are still friends with a host brother. Um, we've, they've come here, we've gone there. So we've spent a lot of time in Switzerland. It's hard to pick otherwise. There, yeah. any, any travel that we do together is good. Well, then I'll ask you a different question. What is on your bucket list of the places you haven't been to that you want to go to? Well, the, the pandemic has has slowed us down. <laughs> yeah. um, Needless to say, we stayed home <laughs> because our our, um, our Swiss friends uh, have said, "When are you coming? When are you coming?" And and obviously this thing. That's right. Pandemic, when when the corner store is your your bucket list of where you'd like to yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> so so that was a little difficult, but but that, that was an interesting relationship that as a uh, a you know, uh, an exchange student um, that we just, it continued. It, it just continued on. Uh, one time we shared 16 year old sons 
and 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and and switch them. And so it, that was was has been a good thing. But bucket list. Uh, We've talked about Petra. Oh, oh yeah, I I'd I'd like to get to Petra. Yeah. It's supposed to be pretty spectacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We, we'd like to get there yet. Um, in in Jordan and um, so there are a few places we'd like to go back to. Uh, we've done number of cruises, and there you stop and visit for a day, and stop in a new place and visit for a day, and you kind of get a taste of something and say that's the place I want to go back. Yeah. Uh, so there's a few of those places as well. Well, uh, very cool. Well, I hope you get to Petra soon. Yeah. Uh, and and before we close. Uh, do you have any thoughts about uh, the future of, uh, of orchestra, the future of orchestral music? How are we going to emerge from this pandemic? And, and what are your thoughts about how that will be? I, I, I thought of that question uh, preparing for, for, for your interview. And, and I think the pandemic has made us realize that the word live is extremely important. Think of the arguments that we hear about education of um, I want my kid back in school. I want, I want, you know, in person, this and this and that Uh, we all have our streaming devices. We all have our recordings. Those are all nice, but what do you hear about? I, I long to get back to a concert. I want to go to, I remember this concert that, and, and it's that personal, um, you know, bringing the stage down to the to the people, and and likewise yeah. the other other way around. And I think live music will will come out just fine uh, in the future because I think it's a longing of of people, and this pandemic has stamped it onto us, saying, "Look what you're missing." Yeah, you know, get this over with. So, because look 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 what you're missing. So. Uh, th- those would be kind of my thoughts there. So well, anything you want to add to that, Karen? Well, I think that the virtual concerts that you have had it, have continued to keep the flavor for the audience that they can long for being able to be there in the hall with us, uh, but still be able to listen to the orchestra. Um, so I think you're keeping it alive in well, the Harrisburg area. It, I, I'm sure that audience will come back. Uh, yeah, it's we're easy. certainly trying hard. And, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. but I will say that there is always that tinge of sadness watching these streams as proud as I am of them. And they've been, I think, extremely good. Uh, there's always that feeling like, oh, if only we could have right. done that yeah. to yeah. a live audience. Well, listen, I hope that we'll all be back on stage very, very soon. I do think there are encouraging signs out there. And uh, yeah. in the meantime, thank you so much for spending this, uh, this time with us. Uh, and I, I also want to say that it's just such a pleasure having you guys in the orchestra, uh, both on a professional and a personal level. Your playing is at the very highest level, but you're also just lovely people to have around, like so many others in this orchestra. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. right. Yep. So many, many thanks. And I hope to see you face to face very soon. Thanks for thank having you. us. Pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Karen and Duane, for sharing your experiences and your time with us today on Conversations with the Maestro. It has been quite a year this year, needless to say, for the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra and for me. But these videos have been a lovely way for us to keep in contact with you, our patrons. Thank you so much for watching them. Uh, Keep your eyes open because we still have a few more concerts this season. We will have uh, our final masterworks and our final pops of the uh, 2021 season coming up soon. And also, uh, keep an eye open for information about potential concerts going forward. We're in talks now about what we're planning to do this summer uh, and next fall. Uh, Of course, this will all depend on information we get from the state and from the uh, federal government. Um, But we're doing everything we can to get back into live music so we can perform in person for all of you here in the Harrisburg region. Uh, Thank you so much again for joining us today. Stay well and see you next time.